Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Thanks for being here. We are on to part two of our Viking Sax build. In the first uh, video, we forged a blade from a piece of antique anchor chain, wrought iron anchor chain, and some Damascus or pattern welded steel of my own uh, made from 1095 and 15 and 20 steel. So we've done, done a lot of forging, done forge welding and heat treating, and so up to this point, we have taken the time to put into this chunk of steel all of the necessary qualities for a good blade. And now at this point in the game, it's time to bring those out. And so I forged the bevel in, left it uh, fairly thick before heat treat, but everything is done to this point uh, that's going to happen to the steel internally. So now it's time to refine the shape of the blade. Um, grind the bevels in the rest of the way and reveal the uh, intrinsic qualities that we put into the blade pattern wise and so forth. So I'm going to start that by cleaning up the profile on the grinder here and I'm using uh, ceramic belts from Empire Braces. These are actually the the best belts that I've used uh, and I've used quite a number of different belts but if you go to the link in the description, video description and use uh, promo code FIREKREEK, all one word no spaces you can get 10% off at Empire Braces and you help the channel out as well, so I appreciate that. So one of the reasons why you leave the uh, blade thicker prior to heat treating is because of the decarburization that occurs. So you want to make sure that you grind away that skin of, um, um, in effect, low carbon steel at that point. You don't want that in your blade uh, near the edge obviously and it's also it would also adversely affect the the etch the uh, bringing out the pattern of the Damascus steel so all this material needs to come off uh, a little bit here it's also going to reduce the weight of the blade somewhat here I am making sure that we have a consistent thickness down the edge down the center of the blade and it's, it's fairly close um, you know forging it in by by hand with a hammer you can get things pretty close, but it's not going to be 100% flat. Uh, there's some minor irregularities and so forth. So the first thing I'm doing is, is making a consistent thickness. And once we have that, basically you just continue to follow that um, down on each side towards the center of the blade to get to your desired uh, finished edge thickness prior to putting on the primary bevel. And of course this takes care and uh, concentration and time you don't want to uh, you know grind out a gouge in your blade or anything like that that would you know render all of our work to this point useless and uh, and uh, cause major problems so you know you can you can spend a lot of time forging a blade but it's easy to to ruin it on a grinder in less than three seconds so it takes it uh, it's worth it to take your time here so continuing to grind these bevels here and this is a essentially what we would call a saber grind which is a flat grind that does not extend all the way up to the uh, back of the, or the spine of the blade. Now of course since we've completed the heat treating on this knife uh, on this blade, the, the uh, hardening and the tempering, if we were to get this blade hotter than the last tempering process we would lose some hardness on our blade so keeping that blade uh, cool off in that in the water during the grinding process is crucial. So I've I've ground it down to 240 grit, which isn't super high, but uh, high enough to move to hand sanding now. And I'll move through uh, several different grits to get up to a thousand grit on this blade. I'll actually start with 240 grit uh, hand sanding here, and remove all of the grind marks that are perpendicular to the blade. And we'll have some a some, uh, little bit finer and more even um, surfaces on the flats of the blade. And then I'll move up to uh, 320 grit, then 600, then 1000 grit on this blade. And all of this takes several hours, um, at least a couple hours to do. So um, that's uh, obviously not all in the video. <laughs> so, all right, so we finally got this uh, blade hand sanded and finished out and it's time to etch it. So I'm mixing up a new batch of etchant here of ferric chloride and a lot of guys use like a 4 to 1 ratio uh, you know acid to water or water to acid I should say 
but the main thing is make sure that it's not too uh, too strong starting out. It's you can always add more acid, more chloride, uh, but you know if you start out with too much, you're gonna have to dilute it down. Too much acid in your mix is gonna give you a, a muddy looking um, fuzzy kind of etch because it's gonna it's gonna attack the nickel content steel too much. Um, whereas when it's uh, more diluted or weaker, the the nickel content steel is able to resist it much better, whereas the regular carbon steel does not, and then it, and that gives you the desired uh, process and the desired effect without uh, messing up the the uh, surface or the look of the steel. And I had it in the etch, I think, three times on this, um, and I'm just cleaning the oxides off there, so shining up that uh, 15 and 20 steel that's visible, and I went over the uh, wrought iron as well. So what's happening with the wrought iron is because of the natural uh, fibrous uh, type grain that it has with the silica content in there, the, the silica grains running linearly through through the iron, it provides a um, distinct pattern that's not unlike pattern welded steel, um, which obviously are two dissimilar types of material, one of which is resisting the acid edge. So we'll see that in the uh, rod iron as well. So cleaning up the shoulders to fit a, a, uh, a plate, I wouldn't really call it a guard, uh, but it fit a brass plate up against, uh, up against the blade there. And uh, I needed to, to temper down the, uh, the steel portion of the tang here because it was obviously too hard to conveniently file. And so I tempered the whole tang out here as you can see. So this is an interesting thing to talk about for a minute. So you can see the, the temper or oxidization colors, tempering colors uh, on the tang here. And there's two things you'll notice. Um, as you're aware from watching the first video that the tang on this blade, as is the whole blade, is comprised of uh, a piece of iron and a, and a piece of uh, steel with various steels in that. And so half of it has basically zero carbon in it. And the other has... Uh, you know, high carbon content. However, you're looking at the same color of tempering colors on those two materials. And so it's important to remember that if you're drawing a temper uh, the, the old fashioned way, watching those colors run to the edge and so forth, it's important to note that they really don't mean anything unless you have a fairly good idea of the carbon content of your steel. Um, just drawing, you know, drawing a, a piece of steel to say a, a dark straw color or whatever is irrelevant unless, you know, it has a specific amount of carbon in it. Because you can draw a piece of iron to a dark straw color as well, and obviously it will not be hard at all and won't make a good blade. So um, that's just, you know, that's just uh, something to note if you're if you're into uh, doing things a more primitive or traditional way. So in the old days when blacksmiths would, uh, you, know, you, you know, you can find recipes for heat treating stuff and, you know, draw, you know, draw this tool to this color. Well, unless you know the carbon content, at least approximately, it doesn't really help. So another thing I'll point out is if you notice the colors were running quicker on the uh, steel, and I believe that's because of the nickel content in the, in the pattern welded steel. So we've got a piece of brass here. I kind of wanted to use bronze, but I could not find any bronze, any remotely close to uh, the dimensions that I needed, and I already had brass on hand. So in the interest, interest of expediency and getting the project done, um, went ahead with brass. But it is a, it's a thinner piece, it's an eighth of an inch thick, and it's not meant to, to figure heavily into the, uh, into the handle. It's more of a uh, clean and uh, you know just a good, uh, plate to go up against the uh, shoulders of this of this blade or the tang here. So getting that fitted to the tang and uh, as usual uh, cutting out and filing or drilling out and filing and uh, fitting and then some some pressure pressure fitting if you will uh, driving that down with my uh, specialized tool here and getting a nice tight fit. So of course brass is a pretty soft material compared to steel, uh, but I can you can get it a little bit softer by softening it, and that is heating it up to a red color and quenching it in water. This is how you soften copper alloys such as brass. 
quite the opposite of steel, obviously. But this will give me a, uh, a little more elasticity or ductility, if you will, to drive this down onto the uh, tang of this blade and get a, get a good fit here. Now obviously it's important to make sure that you have a continuous, although gradual, taper to your tang, otherwise this isn't really going to work. And once you've uh, driven it down as far as it will go without you know, deforming things too much, then you can look and see where the, uh, where the tang is hitting and then uh, remove material carefully from that location. All right, there's our brass plate fit to the tang, ready to go, and here's a piece of elk antler. So we're not just gonna be sticking a handle on this sax. It's gonna be a little more involved than that. So make sure you come back for the third video, uh, final installment here. You'll be able to see this thing in all of its glory. As always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you on the next video.